So now that we are done with uh, memory hierarchy and uh, we understand the notion of caches, DRAM and uh, storage, it's time to go back and look at the processor and then how it uh, interacts to uh, improve uh, the instruction level parallelism that we, we uh, discussed a few weeks back in the form of uh, out of order execution and superscalar processor. So uh, if we go back, we, we discussed the notion of out of order processor where instructions are getting executed out of order. And but but we were fetching instructions in order and we introduced a notion of commit that uh, instructions should be committed in order otherwise uh, we will get an imprecise state of the processor. So uh, in this lecture we will uh, go into the details of uh, what is called a, a dynamic scheduling that uh, tries to improve uh, the instruction level parallelism further uh, trying to execute uh, more and more instructions uh, as long as they are independent. So there is a notion of static scheduling also because compiler can also generate instruction in such a way that uh, it will improve uh, the instruction with parallelism but this lecture won't go into uh, the detail of the compiler approach if you are interested you can um, refer the book or you can you can uh, refer compiler scheduling or static scheduling approaches okay so before we uh, go into the details so the dynamic scheduling that we will be discussing is uh, known as the Tomasulos algorithm or the Tomasulos uh, organization, which came uh, sometime in the early 1960s. Uh, so, if you look at the slide, uh, the slide has so many uh, new terms. The first one is the reservation stations, and you will find that everywhere there is uh, FP mentioned. Uh, so, FP stands for floating point. So the idea was actually proposed for improving floating point uh, performance, uh, floating point instruction performance, but you can replace uh, floating point with anything. So you can assume that these are your registers, these are uh, your multipliers. You, you should have multiple uh, multipliers and multiple orders because you are going for out of order execution. Okay. And this is uh, your uh, DRAM from which you are getting the load from. And this is again sorry uh, this is again uh, going to DRAM for your stores okay so one interesting thing that has uh, that was not there before is the notion of something called a common data bus or CDB which is connected to all the units so if you look at uh, your, your uh, load buffer which uh, gets data from memory is connected to this bus all the execution units these are the execution units let's say order multiplier divider whatever they they are connected to this common data bus and even the results are going back to uh, the reservation station from this common data bus so which means uh, it's a bus that is kind of broadcasting all the updates that are happening in the processor okay before we jump into the details, uh, let's understand the role of uh, reservation station. So reservation station actually provides all the information that is needed for a particular instruction to get started. And if an instruction is waiting for which instruction it is waiting, uh, who will provide the data, whether it will come from the memory or it will come from some other instruction these are the information will be updated in uh, reservation station. So you can assume this is a one stop place where all the information for a particular instruction, uh, depending on which uh, execution unit it, it's waiting for, will be provided here. Right? Another new thing is something called operation queue. It is also known as the instruction queue. So what happens after uh, we fetch our instruction, we uh, put this instruction inside a queue. And uh, from this instruction queue, we'll uh, send this instruction to uh, the different execution units, provided uh, they, they don't have any structural hazard because these execution units are also limited. And provided there is no data hazard. Uh, remember your uh, write after read, read after write and WA uh, 
uh, right up to right feather, right? So we, we, with this introduction, let, let's uh, look into the semantics of uh, this Thomas Law's uh, organization. So everything is distributed with uh, this organization um, and then and nothing centralized and whoever does what, they update through uh, the common data bus that I have already discussed. Uh, there is an implicit register renaming happening because of this organization because now instructions don't operate on register names instead they operate on the reservation stations the reservation stations will actually tell you who will provide you the updated value of a particular register so instead of using the name of the register you can say that okay uh, reservation, as per reservation station xyg uh, the current instruction will get the data from let's say memory or from other instruction which is executing in multiplier okay and so that is nothing but a pointer to your register instead of storing the name itself. Uh, so even the loads and stores, they are treated as functional units uh, similar to uh, your execution units like um, order multiplier. And one another new thing that has happened is the decode stage of the vanilla five stage pipeline has been split into two states. So now one is called the issue stage where we do what we were doing before uh, the de decoding of instruction and we also check for structural hazard at this moment. So here structural hazard will mean whether a functional unit is free for me uh, so that I can go ahead and execute. And the second stage is uh, nothing but uh, reading the operands but we read the operands until we, we, we actually read the operands once they become available, right? So we wait until there is no data hazard and once the data hazard is resolved, then we read the operands. So in some other processor, you will find uh, these two stages are known as the dispatch and issue. But in this course, we'll use issue and read. Even the textbook follows this uh, uh, terminology, so it will be easy for you. Okay, in the reservation station, what exactly is stored? So it will store the operation uh, that we are performing. Um, let's say addition, multi multiplication or whatever. Then it also stores the value of operands. So let's say if you have written instruction like R1, R2, R3, and if you know, uh, uh, their value so you will actually directly put put their values which is nothing but let's say content of r1 content of r2 and content of r3 uh, in, in case all of them are source operand otherwise if these two are source operand then r2 and r3's content will be stored in vj and vk uh, there are other fields which are populated when the source operands are not available which means that there is a possibility of uh, hazard and we are waiting for the data. In that case, it will actually uh, store the source of th those uh, values, like who will provide those values, whether it's produ uh, produced by uh, some, some uh, load instruction or whether it's produced by some other addition or multiplication instruction, those things will be uh, stored here. And uh, if, that there are no entries in uh, these two fields that means the instruction is ready uh, that there is uh, no need to wait for anyone it can go into the functional unit and start executing uh, there is another field called vg which means the functional unit is busy which means it can lead to structural hazard so for example you have two multipliers but uh, your, your issue stage has uh, just looked at that okay there is another multiplication instruction coming in but you won't be able to uh, go for that because uh, your multiplier is busy right and similarly for each register it, it will uh, actually show who will actually write into that register okay uh, so for example it may happen that there is r r1 r2 r3 here and it can happen that there is something like load r2 m100 kind of 
which means R2 is getting updated from the load. Right? So that, that should be you know, populated uh, here also. Okay. And uh, compared to our uh, five stage pipeline, we won't uh, go into uh, each and every stage. For example, we won't uh, discuss the fifth stage and all. What we will discuss now is uh, the notion of issue that we have uh, just discussed, right? So we kind of check for structural hazard, decode, and then we wait uh, until the data is uh, free or it's, it's not leading to any data hazard. Then we execute when both the operands are uh, available for us, right? If not, we just keep on waiting for the data in the common data bus. So in all these cases, you will uh, find the notion of tag. Uh, you will actually compare the tag and then, then see whether the data that is coming in the common data bus is actually for you, okay? Once you finish the execution, you it's time to write the result into the common data bus so that all the uh, waiting instruction, all the uh, microarchitecture structure which are waiting for that result, they can then uh, start uh, doing what they are supposed to do. The common data bus, it, it populates the data along with the source, like who is uh, providing uh, the data, right? So uh, depending on the number of functional units you have, let's say uh, 10 adders, 20 multipliers, uh, 30, 40 uh, load queue entries and all, you will need a tag uh, to find out, okay, who has actually provided uh, this particular data, right? And uh, you actually update uh, or you actually move on uh, into the pipeline, into the execute stage. If, if you actually get the data from the source that you are expecting from, right? Okay, so uh, in summary, now uh, instruction fetch still happens in order, but the instructions are enqueued in a queue called instruction queue. And this, uh, instructions will be now issued from the instruction queue depending on whether we are getting a structural hazard whether we are getting a data hazard uh, there is a data dependency and finally we execute out of order once it is done we update into the common data bus we introduce the notion of register renaming in which we don't use the name of the register explicitly instead we use the reservation station tag and because of which it eliminates your uh, WAR and WAW hazards. Okay. So with this, let, let's look into an example and hopefully this will clarify everything. So here we are showing uh, six instructions, uh, two load, one multiplier, uh, one subtract, which will need an order. Even the R will need an order. And let's assume the multiplier and divider will uh, need the multiplier. Okay, uh, this particular uh, uh, table will actually show you what's happening. This is not a micro architectural table. This is just a uh, table for us to understand uh, what is happening uh, at, at a different um, point of time. So we'll actually uh, update this table whenever some, some instruction get issued or they complete the execution or they write the result. Okay, this is our load buffer. This is our reservation station. Remember whether it's busy or not, what operation it is doing. These are the sources. Uh, I mean, uh, the values itself. And if the values are not uh, available, then what are the sources of uh, those values, right? So you look into it. And these are the registers. Let's say we have uh, you know, 31 registers here, okay? So uh, let, let's start looking into it. But before that, uh, let's assume that load is taking around two cycles and uh, floating point R uh, subtract will also take two cycles and multiply and divide, they take 10 and 40 cycles respectively. Okay. So this is just a, uh, just an example to uh, understand the notion of out of order execution and how uh, this dynamic scheduling uh, happens, right? So let's start with uh, the first instruction, clock cycle one, it is issued. It's a load instruction. So now this is our load buffer, which is busy. 
it's actually sent the address to the memory hierarchy it will go through the caches memory and finally it will get the data the data will be updated into f6 that means now f6 is dependent on the load one okay let's move on we can also have multiple loads outstanding now okay can you can you see the uh, notion of uh, out of order um, uh, execution here so the second load is independent of the first load so you can actually uh, issue them and we will send the address again to the memory hierarchy the result will go to f2 so f2 is now dependent on load 2 okay now from cycle number three we are issuing the multiply instruction and if you look at uh, in detail you'll find that it is depending on f2 which is coming from load and load takes two cycle right so it has to uh, get get the data from the load okay so let, let's look at what does the reservation station says it says that one of the multiplier unit is busy yes the operation it is doing is it is multiplying uh, for f4 it will directly get the data from the register so uh, no issue but for f2 uh, the data is not available yet it's waiting for data from load 2 and load 2 is actually waiting for the data from memory so whenever this particular loads get done we will get the value for f2 and then we can kickstart our uh, multiply okay uh, next is our subtract operation again this will demand uh, an order so here it is the order is busy operation is subtraction it is demanding f6 and f2 right so if you look at f6 f6 is coming from the first load and it is actually done in uh, cycle number four it has actually uh, written the data uh, in cycle number four into the common data bus which means we uh, have the data for f6 right so uh, th this has actually already come from the memory so that's why this memory unit is not busy anymore f6 is uh, storing the data which has come from the memory okay but it is also depending on f2 and you will find that there is no entry for f2 here f2 is waiting for load 2 and load 2 it hasn't updated the common data bus yet once it updates then we can actually start uh, moving into the pipeline so now if you look at cycle number five it is done it, it is actually uh, finished uh, writing the load two and whichever instructions we're waiting for uh, the f2 values they can now move forward so now you can see uh, f2 is no more uh, you know kind of creating dependency or an hazard and the value f2 is actually available for both the subtract operation and the multiply remember for multiplication the delay is 10 cycles so it will take 10 cycles to execute now now the data is available so it will actually go for that and uh, the subtraction operation will take two cycles okay so th this is how uh, the thomas organization works where, where the resolution station kind of helps you to find out what is happening with all these instructions who is waiting for what and then uh, with this we, we kind of distribute our uh, logic of finding out our dependency and then uh, we are creating a notion of uh, register renaming through the use of reservation stations okay so i won't go into the detail of each and every cycle so uh, i would encourage uh, you to go through it for better understanding so uh, finally uh, we will be kind of done at cycle 57 okay so ho hopefully you will uh, reach here if you uh, keep on uh, uh, doing this one of the key things that i want to highlight here is we have done in order issue we have done out of order execution but we have also done out of order completion 
the writing into the common data bus is not happening in the program order if you have looked at it carefully right so this is all okay because so far we haven't introduced the notion of branch prediction speculation or exception or page fault into the scheduling this is kind of a pretty simple scheduling where you you don't have the notion of speculation right uh, in the next lecture we will actually look at the notion of uh, speculative execution and what else we need to uh, do to make sure that we do dynamic scheduling but but at the same time we have to make sure that we can handle uh, let's say a wrong uh, uh, prediction from a branch predictor or a page fault or an exception and then what can be done okay so keep that in mind so so far we haven't done that so if you look at uh, Thomas Sulo and the register renaming it's implicit as uh, I was saying you just need uh, the registration station tags in your instruction saying that okay I'm waiting for registration station 3 and that will provide me the data right there is also a notion of explicit register renaming where you actually store a table and the table actually maps the ISA registers which are visible to the programmer and there are sorry and there are something called the physical registers which are present in the processor right so let's say register R1 is mapped to P1 register R2 is mapped to P30 something like that and the number of physical registers are actually higher than uh, the number of registers which are specified by the ISA. Okay, so the, these registers can be also used uh, if you want to do explicit uh, uh, register renaming. Okay, uh, the issue uh, with uh, this particular approach will be. Uh, yeah, obviously it provides a pretty uh, easy way of uh, finding out uh, when exactly a register is uh, kind of available and then when can be used. But but the moment we get no free registers, we have to stall uh, the issue. Okay. Uh, so in principle, uh, register renaming doesn't require reservation stations. So if you are using uh, explicit register renaming, there is no need for uh, uh, reservation station because uh, your, your uh, remap table will actually help you uh, preventing all kinds of uh, data hazards but you will find that in modern uh, micro architecture you uh, there are register rename tables uh, or the remap tables along with the resolution stations which actually controls the entire uh, scheduling okay so with that i will stop thank you